<laughs> Thank you so much for coming to the Race and Criminal Justice System Forum series, which is put on by the Department of Social Sciences and Criminal Justice. This is our first forum, the topic of which is contextualizing the current racial protests. So I'll be your moderator, and I'm just going to introduce the forum um, and set some expectations before I turn it over to our three speakers tonight, who I'll also introduce. So to introduce the forum, the purpose of this forum is to create a space for the UW Platteville community to learn about historical, structural, and systemic issues related to race in the criminal justice system. Series contributors include scholars, experts, and field practitioners, each offering different insights into the issues and providing suggestions of, sorry, I can't, about what we as a society and as individuals can do to affect change. This series fits with UW Platteville's long tradition of developing innovative beyond the classroom opportunities for student learning and helping the wider community to better understand such significant moments of social change. The series also fits within the broader democratic tradition of working towards a more just an egalitarian society for all. Tonight, our focus is on contextualizing and providing a framework for understanding the current racial protests. So, a couple expectations, because there's like a bunch of us here. One is if you notice you're muted, that's just because there's so many of us, the background noise can get distracting. And then if you look at the chat function, you really can only chat with me, um, your moderator, because um, Chat can be a way that ends up distracting people um, from listening to the speakers and we want to give full attention to our speakers. So some expectations so that we can all have a really great learning experience tonight. Um, one, it's of course an expectation in the space that questions, thoughts, and ideas are expressed with civility and respect. During our speakers' presentations, you should listen with curiosity and a willingness to learn because the goal for all of us here tonight is to expand knowledge and understanding. So take the time you need to reflect and engage with different viewpoints as they're presented tonight. And I would say, especially with those with whom you disagree. The other thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to consider as you're listening to our speakers, what questions you might have for the Q&A. And then just a reminder, um, this is for the students in the class. Hello, this is also recorded. Okay, guidelines for Q&A. So our basic outline is going to be, um, we will have speaker one, speaker two, speaker three, and then time for Q&A at the end. So due to the large number of participants, what I'm asking that you'll do is that you can write your questions in the chat function which will be directed to me. Um, if you can ask questions rather than state comments, and then because there are so many of us, um, it might not be possible for all questions to be addressed. And so questions that are clearly written, open-ended and directly connected to the speaker's presentations have a higher likelihood of being selected. I am an English instructor after all. Um, in your question, please identify yourself. your academic year and your um, major. If you're a community member, please provide your location and position if relevant. And then if you want to follow it up, please do so with Travis Nelson, who's the chair of criminal justice. His email address is right here. So now I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker. Um, Dr. Shan Sappleton, who's an associate professor of political science here at the University of Wisconsin Platteville, where she teaches courses in political science, comparative politics, and international relations. So let's all give a warm welcome, but silently muted, um, to our first speaker, Dr. Sappleton. Thank you, um, Amanda. I am going to try to share my screen here, so um, bear with me for a second while I do that. Um, okay, um, I think we're fine. Can you all see that? Would you just nod at me if you can? Awesome. All right, so we are here to talk about race in the criminal justice system. Specifically, our session today will be on contextualizing the current um, racial protests and 
most of you, almost all of you should know what has happened this past summer with all the names that I could throw at you. And so all of these events, shootings, police involved, non-police involved, um, with regards to George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ray Sherb Brooks and Jacob um, Blake and Kenosha, which brought it right home um, to us here in Wisconsin. Um, Afford, allows us to have a space on our campus to talk about this. And this is exactly what we're trying to do in this forum. So first of all, I wanted to thank um, Travis Nelson and the CGA department for sponsoring um, this program for all of the organizers who helped to put this together, like worked long hours, met on Zoom multiple times, and all of you for um, participating. So welcome, and my name is Jan Sappleton, and I'm just gonna jump right into it. Um, but before we get to what the forum is about specifically, I, I, I would like to talk about what the forum is not. So just so we're clear, we're on the same page. Um, this is what the forum is um, not about, right? So the forum is not at all, um, supposed to be anti-police. There are no anti-police statements here or sentiments, um, so you won't find that here. That's not what we're about. It is also not at all about racial bashing or casting anyone or making anyone feel uncomfortable um, with regards to being considered racist, right? Um, that's not what we're here for. Essentially what this forum is, is as Dr. Chaka pointed out, is a, a pretty much a space for us to gather, kind of um, think of this as a public sphere within a democracy, right? Um, so a public sphere where we can gather to talk about issues that are happening within our society and specifically the protests and the underlying causes of the protests that we all pretty much experienced or um, um, over the summer, right? Um, so again, the George Floyd incident and what is horrible about COVID and also weirdly positive about living through COVID this past summer is that we could all not avoid right hearing or watching some of these um things happen in real time right whether on our laptops on our um, um cell phones or whatever we could not escape it and so kind of like for the first time in a long time um we are all on the same page in terms of our concerns and so what we're hoping for with regards to this forum is to use the space as a public sphere um, on our campus where our students can really lean in if you're not aware now you will be right so all those names that I threw out at you, go and look them up or you'll be hearing more about them more specifically in the other um, portions of the, of the forum. Um, and as a political scientist, I can't help but put this within a um, context of democracy, right? So here we live in a democracy. Fortunately, if we're in a democracy, you're allowed in the public sphere to voice your opinions to those who are in position of power, um, demand change where we see that there's change that needs to be done. And if nothing else, all of those concentrated events in terms of the shootings um, that happened over the summer um, forced us to um, in engage with a problem within our society, one that has a racial slant. And so we're looking at why these protests happen when they did over the summer and right what are the ways in which these issues these underlying issues actually force us to confront right what are some of the problems within our democracy and also how can we fix them right another question that we should be engaging in is the extent to which these underlying issues should they persist threaten our democracy right one of the central tenets of democracy in addition to liberty and freedom is equality for all and so here we are in this moment really forced to, to confront whether or not there is in fact equality for all. And what does that then say about our own democracy, right? Before we can get to solutions, we must be ready to identify and acknowledge the problem. And so if the problem is around, um, centered around equality, then before we get to solutions, we have to figure out what that problem is. And lastly, to all of you who are students here, specifically your freshmen, our freshmen, welcome. Um, I'm excited to have you particularly here because in about, you know, 15 years or so, you will be the future leaders of this country. Um, so you will be making decisions with regards to the kinds of changes that are being asked for, right? So can, you will be, in fact, we will put our lives in your hand to provide for a society that lives up to our democratic ideals, one in which we have truly liberty, freedom, and equality um, for all. Um, 
Next, I want to talk about the protests themselves. So really, what are these protests about exactly, um, right? Um, again, we talked about all of the list of names um, and the associated events over the summer with George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ray Shard, all of those kind of brought to the fore um, a number of issues related to um, racial inequalities within our country, right? So here people are literally in the streets protesting um, as a response to what is seen as injustices and inequalities within our society. And um, one of the central messages of these protests is um, that these incidents that we lived through and we could not get away from because of COVID um, um, this summer are part of a larger pattern. So in as much as I could list all those names over this past summer, there's a longer list, right? If we were to go back five years, 10 years, Tamar um, Rice, um, Sandra Blount, Eric Garner, right? And so the message here is, yes, we're paying attention now, but don't think that this is just happening in the now. These, uh, these are examples of issues that are broader and more pervasive within our society, um, specifically with regards to our criminal justice system, but not exclusively. And so what are the inequalities within our society that need immediate attention, right? Um, to call attention to the need for systemic change. And by systemic change, we mean here, not just to the issues related to shootings or police shootings, right? But more so systemically that's happening in our education system or institution of higher learning or the ways in which, right? There are disparities in experiences and outcomes that need to be to be addressed within our societies. And again, to make that bigger call for greater levels of equality, um, a more egalitarian society for ourselves and our future children. Like we all want to have a more egalitarian society. Our democracy demands this as us, so of us. So what are the ways in which we can, in fact, whether in the future or right now, seek to um, achieve um, those more fully? So what do protesters want more precisely? Well, um, here is where I'm going to put on my political science hat, right? So when I'm teaching intro to politics, I often go through these basic definitions, right? And I think like based on the misinformation out there and like all the news and everyone talking head having a perception of what justice is, what it means to be rule of law, um, it, it's incumbent on us to take a minute to really solidly define these terms. So the first of all, they're demanding justice. Well, what does justice mean? They're not asking for special treatment, right? They're simply asking for a uniform distribution of the rewards and punishment of society, right? No one group or no one individual should feel that they're having a, bear a heavier burden of the, of the, the, the punishment um, as opposed to engaging in the rewards, right? So can we establish a sense of fairness around all individuals within society where they feel like justice has been met, like we have equal share and distribution in the rewards and punishments um, system around us. Um, and that, of course, informs rule of law. So what we mean by rule of law, that term is like thrown out, especially selection cycle, right? So it's thrown out a lot. Well, rule of law simply means at this basic level, it means a uniform set of laws to which all are subject within the society. In other words, no one should be treated differently on the basis of race, on the basis of gender, on the basis of class, right? If you break the law, you, regardless of who you are, you should expect the same kind of punishment. And in as much as we do not have that within our society, and that's what some of the protests are pointing to with the um, recent events, um, on the shootings, right, that there are in the application of these um, laws, there are disparities in outcomes. It seems like one group, um, right, if they're walking away from the police, this happened in Kenosha, um, unarmed, um, then they, you kind of get the death penalty. You can have um, a knee in your neck that results in your death for passing supposedly a, um, a bad note, right, a bad check. Um, as opposed to, right, someone else walking in the street armed with, um, towards the police um, with a firearm and then gets to go home and sleep in his bed and wake up the next morning and turn themselves in and live, right? Or the Dylan Roofs of the world or the however many school shooting shooters that we have that some somehow get taken in alive um, and well as opposed to meeting the same kinds of um, um, system of justice um, that others are subject to. And so fundamentally, um, protesters are asking for meaningful and systemic change, not just 
um, platitudes and promises for the future. They're demanding that now, right? Um, so there have been lots of promises made about changes and change will come and you have to be patient and protesters are saying no look at the sheer number of names we can list off as uh, of, of um, shootings that have happened over the summer like change needs to come and it needs to come now and we're no longer going to be patient right so that is a message as a democracy our leaders are expected to make decisions in the interest of all within the society and therefore now we require systemic change um, with these issues and mostly more than anything Thing, right? What is being asked here is not, it's, it's just a simple ask, really. It's like, have a democracy, right, in which there's more, um, a, a, a more egalitarian society for everyone involved, right? To, to move to, to, to make a stronger social contract, um, and to have a more perfect union where individuals feel truly um, treated equally, as opposed to being targeted in any meaningful way. Um, so I, I think at this point, I really, really want to go over some of the myths and misconceptions about race and racism and, and the pro as we regard the protest um, um, that I hear all the time. And I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to pick a few in the interest of time. Um, so I think the first one that I'll talk about is that Systemic racism is a myth or anti-racism is a cult, right? And um, it's kind of not. And if anything, again, COVID kind of forced us in society to reckon with this. Like these things are happening and they happen in concentration um, concentrated numbers over the summer, which points to a larger issue and an issue that um, happens not just within the criminal justice system, as I said before, but we can look at other institutions within our society to see um, the problem um, there as well. And if we are going to have the solutions, like I said before, it's very important that we are able to, at a very basic level, acknowledge where the problem exists. And if the problem is broader than an individual bias or an individual um, action, then it requires more than an individual level solution, right? Um, let's see. Pointing out racism is accusing everyone of being racist. Um, no, 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 right? Um, it is incumbent upon us to point out, right? It's, again, the only way to get change is to identify the problem. If it's a systemic racism is a problem, we need to identify it, we need to unravel what that means, what that looks like, in order for us to then have proper solutions um, to correct for that. Uh, with regards to the criminal justice system, I'm just going to emphasize one here that's on my list because um, the next speaker, I think it's Will Lesore, um, Professor Lesore will be going over in more detail some of the specifics, also more of the specific with regards to the recent incidents that we're talking about in the protests and whatnot. Um, and the one that I wanna emphasize here um, have, um, focuses on the law, right? And there's the idea that, or the sentiment that, well, laws are neutral, right? Um, they can never, they're just there to maintain order and promote peace and justice. Um, and that's true in, in, in essence. However, we should just not to be divorced of our historical experiences that, right? So we can go back to slavery. God forbid we should go back to slavery, but as a point of example here, right? Slavery was a legal institution, right? Um, the Holocaust was legal. Those who um, um, tried to protect the, the Jews in Germany, for example, were considered to be criminals. Um, apartheid was legal. Segregation was legal. And so even if um, laws themselves can be, uh, tend to be neutral or can be neutral. It also doesn't mean that their application cannot be problematic, right? So if individuals have these um, racial attitudes or beliefs about superiority, then the application in the neutral law can be problematic. And in as much as we're seeing disparate outcomes, it suggests that the problem exists this somewhere, if not the laws, then it must be in the application of said laws, right? So again, what is the problem before we can jump to um, the conclusion? Um, and myths about the protests more specifically. And I like the first one that I have on this list that, oh, those protesters are undemocratic or they're anti-democratic, right? Or they're unpatriotic. They're not true Americans. And I would just point out to our history, right? That First of all, within a democracy, protest is a right. And here I'm making a distinction between 
protests being peaceful as opposed to riots and vandalism and criminal, criminal activities, right? Um, but I also would like to point out that um, based on the research data, um, reputable research data, 93% of the, the, the protests over the summer have been peaceful, right? And for those of you who are Platteville students, that's an A in my class, <laughs> um, right? That's not an A minus even, that's an A score. Not to negate the importance of some of the riots that have been happening, they have, about 7% of them have been. But the predominant majority, right, um, to the extent that they would get an A score have in fact been peaceful. And so we should also think, okay, right, and be curious about why it is that we're so focused in on the 7% as, as opposed to the 90 percent when we're considering um, these protests. Uh, let's see. Pro-police reform means anti-police or being anti-police. Um, that is not necessarily true. Not to say that everyone who is proposing or all the protesters are, um, propo are, are not um, critical of the police is the essence, but I, I, I really reject the idea that it's one or the other, right? You can, and, and as a matter of fact, I would like to point out that in the same way that African Americans are not inherently unpatriotic, they have fought for almost all the wars that we can list in American history. African Americans have been involved and at the forefront of that, um, right? And the same way we have officers who are Black, right, who are African American and are pro these reforms that are being su um, um, suggested. Why? Because when they take uniforms off, they are viewed as and treated pretty much as um, regular African-American people. So they're subject to the same experiences that the protesters are seeking to highlight, um, right? Um, that all protesters are left-leaning, and I'd like to point out that that's not necessarily true. Libertarians, right? Those who really um, are engaged in the issue regarding equality and equality for all and the government being responsible to its people, within a democracy are, are, are out there demanding um, that we do better as a society. Um, and lastly, the last thing that I will cover um, in the interest of time is what is the value then of these protests and why do they matter? Um, and for me personally, um, it, it is important. Um, I never thought, so I'm from a tiny country with 2.7 million people who like kicked out the British, right, and say, never come back, um, and um, right, won their independence and fought aggressively to maintain that. And um, this is something that, these are things that my ancestors, I feel like, have fought for, and I did not think I would be as closely involved in, in 2020. Nonetheless, I also recognize, um, as an individual, as a political scientist, the importance of protests, specifically with the context of democracy, and bringing about meaningful change or drawing attention to the need thereof. Right, so one of the um, things that I was happy to see come out of these protests is the, 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 the focusing, the zooming in on the issue. We cannot get away from it, right? So that means we're more likely to um, engage it, discuss it, have forums like this on um, these issues, but also like to put these issues into a broader context, right? What does this mean in terms of the long-term effects of racism on the affected groups within our society in terms of the health care? So health disparities, disparities are a thing, right? Social mobility, education, right? Um, there's, there, there are differences in terms of racial performances and the impact of students, and there's research to show that generational trauma actually informs how individuals perform um, um, in, in school. And so since, you know, one of the tenets of our um, founding has to do with the pursuit of happiness, that we should um, seek to develop a society, to create a society in which we can tr all truly pursue our happiness, which is to, right, if you're unarmed, and you're not engaged in um, criminal behavior, that you should not be killed. And even if you have warrants or you have a criminal past, like the, the answer is not for you to end up dead for some slight or minor um, incident, right? At least not when others are committing, so to speak, worse crime and are not being um, treated, needed, the, the same treatment is not being needed out to them. So lastly, I will say if you cannot at all grasp because we in the society do not live the same lived experiences on a daily basis and you can't get with it like, like I just cannot understand what you all are talking about. I will invite you to like engage that sociological imagination, right? 
truth the counterfactual, right? If this were true, then what would that mean for the policies that are being suggested, right? right so put all your critical thinking at hats and really engage in this topic and like, you know, bring them up in your various classrooms and really, really, really think about um, um, the society in which we want to live um, together. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much to Dr. Sappleton for her wonderful and thought-provoking talk. Before I introduce our second speaker, I will just remind our forum participants that you can please feel free to send me questions via the chat at any point for our Q&A. Having said that, I'm going to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Will Lesore, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Criminal Justice at the University of Wisconsin Platteville, where he teaches classes in criminal justice, research methodology, and women, gender, and justice. So another silent but great welcome for our second speaker. Uh, hello, everyone. And um, I hope that you're all warm and dry. It's been a horrible rainy day. But um, I am happy to be here and I'm glad to see so many faces and some I recognize uh, tonight. And I'm hoping tonight to kind of introduce some of the topics from a sociology and criminal justice perspective and to be able to um, address some of the myths, misconceptions, or even just questions about what if um, we know for recently here in Kenosha um we had a the police shooting of jacob blake and while the facts of the case are not fully known yet um we there's been a lot of what ifs and a lot of um you know well this is what happened kind of things and i not a lawyer but i can answer some of those things to the best of my ability um and i'm going to share my screen let's see all right And my computer is not the fastest in the world. So um, in general, I would like to reiterate what Dr. Sappleton mentioned about this entire series. This is an invitation and it's an invitation to listen um, too often, especially on social media. Um, the invitation is to comment and not listen. And the invitation is to opine and to give your opinion on something um, at the spur of the moment without much background, which is fine if we're going to talk about, I don't know, Beyonce's new album. But when it comes to issues of justice, life and death, and frankly, really, really complicated issues of the law, this is difficult, even for the most skilled lawyers, and again, which I'm not one of, or for someone who understands statistics pretty well, I'm one of them. This is still really complicated and there's always the well, but kind of things. The more information, the more we listen, the better we can better assess the situation and talk to it. And we all have personal experiences, right? I've been pulled over a few times. I've been arrested. Um, I just said that on a recording, but I was, I forgot to pay a speeding ticket. And you know, that was a fascinating experience for me. At the same time, it was one experience in a small town of Kent, Ohio. And while I can speak to my own feelings, I can't speak to all arrests based on that, right? At the same, and on the other side is scientific or scientifically gathered data is important because it helps us undo or at least remove some of those biases that creep into things. And this is also an opportunity for us to peek under what W.E.B. Du Bois calls the veil. So in his uh, book, The Souls of Black Folk, and a few others, he talks about this idea that Black Americans, African American Americans, and those with a history of slavery have lived in a different America. And that that reality is different and yet simultaneous to the general white reality of America. And it's, you can, if you're not African American, you can go through your whole life without knowing what is under that metaphorical veil that covers that world. 
and to listen to those voices, whether or not you think they're reliable or correct or anything else, but to listen to that reality is just as important as the empirical reality that may surround it all, just as your own experiences are important in the context of data. So I've, I've been obsessively, I'm a news <clears throat> wonk geek, I don't know how else you want to put it, but I've been following a lot of these cases the best I can. And one thing that is important to know is this is not new. The idea of these protests are rather new, and the phrase Black Lives Matter as a hashtag started in response to the killing of Trayvon Martin by George Zimmerman. And during his acquittal, Twitter lit up in July of 2013 with this hashtag. But these issues of police brutality and in the case of George Zimmerman, vigilante killings of Black and African American citizens and residents, that goes back centuries. And the idea of Jim Crow and lynchings and the KKK and cross burnings and just harassment and sundown towns, we here in Wisconsin have a history of what are called sundown towns, where when the sun goes down, Black folks better be out. And some of them, Appleton and La Crosse were known to be these. Some of them were unofficial, some of them were actually in the law. And the history of policing is complicated. The history of policing has evolved greatly. And yet its roots did start with slave patrols and what were called night watches. So if you've taken the foundations of policing class, it should be old to you. But at the same time, police have been used as an arm of the government and the arm of politics to try to influence and to create a national atmosphere. I'm not saying that that's, um, I'm not saying that the police themselves were necessarily the ones doing it, not the individual officers, but they are subject to politicians and police chiefs and they can be elected officials. And we do know, for example, in the 60s with Martin Luther King and the Black Panthers, that police were used to try to discredit those movements and those people, those individuals. Now again, we're talking about policing as an institution. I can say the exact same thing when it comes to education. And if it comes to policy and trying to convince people, frankly, it's worse in our case. But if I were to critique teachers and professors, I'm not saying I'm wrong or Dr. Sappleton or Dr. Tucker, but rather that the institutions have this history. The 1960s, this is, many people are currently commenting that this is essentially a re 2.0 of the 1960s protests where we saw uh, protests against police brutality and the use of police to quash those protests and the use of uh, water cannons and dogs um, and this is comparably the same. A few cases. I'm going to actually skip over some of the ones you probably know already. You probably know about, for example, Eric Gardner, uh, who the I Can't Breathe slogan started with. But there are dozens of cases I could point to in the past decade that we could look at and see examples of, individual examples of black people being brutalized and killed by police. And again, each incident has tons of facts and details which can help explain and understand the incident, but we're looking at patterns. And just a few to give you some background. Joseph Mann um, was a, I believe it was in Los Angeles or Sacramento, uh, he and the next gentleman, uh, Mr. Robinson, were both mentally ill individuals. In the case of Joseph Mann, uh, he was having a schizophrenic episode. Um, he was swinging objects at people and things around him. And the officer, one of the officers in that case, decided to try to run him over. They missed and then shot him 14 times. His partner encouraged him to run him over. And they were caught on tape, and that's the only way we know about this. Mr. Robinson uh, was also having a mental illness uh, episode. Uh, I believe it was his sister had called for assistance, and he ended up dead. And this is one thing that we talk about with the defund the police slogan. Unfortunately, our police are expected to become the interveners for mental health crises. And they're generally not trained to do that, nor should we really expect them to be medical 
mental health professionals. Unfortunately though, especially when it comes to black men in mental health crises, we see that the result is too often death. Timothy Russell, Melissa Williams, so I I'm from Cleveland originally, and this case comes from Cleveland, was a police chase that involved something like 40 cruisers across seven jurisdictions and ended up with 137 shots and one officer literally standing on the hood of the car shooting into the driver and passenger seat. No weapons were found. They heard a backfire of a car. Jonathan Farrell, um, he actually was ran out of gas, if I remember correctly, went to someone's home, asked for help. That person called the police. The police showed up. He then ran to, towards the police saying, oh, thank God you're here. Can you help me? And they shot him. Um, Mr. Bradford is actually a really kind of tragic case, but it was, he was one of the good guys with a gun in a mall uh, shooting incident in Texas. He himself had a gun, was a civilian trying to stop the shooter. Police saw him and their first reaction was to shoot him. John Edwards um, was a boy who was at a party. Someone called because it was noisy, a bunch of underage drinking. Um, the officer showed up with long, a rifle in this case, a car backfired and they shot at the car as it drove away and shot him in the back of the head. Elijah McCain, this is one you may have heard more recently, a young man uh, known, he liked to play the violin and he was an example of a chokehold, just like Eric Gardner uh, and other recent examples of a carotid hold, which restricts blood flow to the brain, rendering unconsciousness. And these are, again, individually, we can look at each case, we can look at the facts of the case, but the problem is, is there's a pattern. And we keep seeing this over and over again. John Crawford III was holding a BB gun in a Walmart, shot dead by police in a state that had open carry. Uh, Walter Scott was running from police in South Carolina, shot in the back multiple times. Samuel Du Bois, Cincinnati, uh, was pulled over by police for a broken taillight, um, started to roll the car to leave. The officer claims he thought he was being dragged by the car and was shot. Philando Castile, reaching for his own ID after telling the officers he had a legal carry, uh, concealed carry, was shot in front of his girlfriend and child. And there's tragedy behind these. We are, as a nation, unusual. We have almost a thousand fatal police shootings per year. This is unheard of in any other developed country. And I say developed and actually even developing countries. This is unheard of. In one month, we had as many fatal shootings as Australia did in two decades. And Australia has guns. It's not just that, oh, they don't have guns in England. Eh, no, Australia does have guns. Black men are found to be about 2.5 times more likely to be killed by police than white men per capita per encounter. Black women are found to be more likely to be killed by police than white women. And they are, again, this is, we also can look at other ethnicities and races. All of them are still higher than white folks with the exception of Asian Americans. We're also talking about young folks. When we're talking about this issue statistically, we're talking about young black men. And the issue of gender, as I, uh, Dr. Tucker introduced me, I studied gender as one of my areas, it's almost entirely men. And one thing that we don't ever talk about is why are we talking about young men in all these cases as well? I'm gonna leave that question hanging, we don't have time for that, but. And one thing if we look at, out of all deaths of black men between the ages of 20 and 24, 1.6 were due to police. And it is literally one of the top 10 causes of death for this group. Followed, it is only preceded by accidents, including drugs, suicide, uh, heart attacks, cancer, and uh, there's one other I'm missing off the top of my head. We do have a fair number of myths and misconceptions that Dr. Sapleton addressed a number of them. Uh, I was going to try to address some of the more CJ side of them, 
one of them is if, and I've seen this so many times and heard it from my own family, if you don't do crime, the cops don't bother you. Well, depends where you are, who you are, and where you live. Here in Platteville, maybe so. You know, the cops might bother you if you're really, really drunk in public. But in other places like New York City, it was actually the policy to bother people called stop and frisk. Um, there's also something called a pretextual stop. And so one thing I was looking at recently is many of these cases that were related to Black Lives Matter protests, the individuals were stopped by police in their car for things like not using a blinker, having a tail light out, um, having a muffler bad. And these are called pretextual stops. They're legal. The Supreme Court has said they're legal. They're known to be used to racially profile. And yet the Supreme Court has said if there is a legal reason behind it, it's still legal, despite any potential other motives. And the other one is, as I just mentioned earlier, being mentally ill is not a crime. And yet police are called to those incidences many times. Maybe public, um, a public nuisance or endangerment issues. But when it comes to a mental illness or intoxication issues, the expectation is there's no malice in that particular act, right? So for the CJ students in the room, mens rea, the guilty mind, right? Um, that is lacking in those cases, and yet police are called to them and treat them as if they were violent criminals in some cases. Things are changing, right? We are working on that in general. And more recently, we've heard about the no-knock warrant issues. Uh, so no-knock warrants are warrants that are issued where they do not need to knock and announce. And even recently, a Michigan case said knock and announce is in a couple seconds. But these have unfortunately led to the deaths of individuals by sheer mistake. The other question is who is being policed? If you live in a small community, chances are you're not going to be bothered by police. If you're living in an urban context, chances are you're going to run into the police a lot more frequently. I had a friend on Facebook, and I thought it was interesting, just an anecdote, but she had asked, how many of you, how old were you when the police first pulled a gun on you? And my answer, of course, was never. But she grew up in East Cleveland, and many of her friends were saying 11, 15, 12, 20. The other one that we've seen, and this was especially recently in the um, Kenosha case, is just comply, and there's other issues of use of force. Police are bound by the U.S. Constitution and other court rulings and interpretations of it. And Graham B. Connor of 1989 was the one that set a reasonable standard of a reasonable officer given that situation. Force must be appropriate and um, in context to any resistance being given. You can't use a bazooka to stop someone from speeding, right? Like you can't have something outrageously unbalanced like that. And one of the other things we've seen in the case, uh, so in the Kenosha case with uh, Jacob Blake is le retreating, leaving, walking, running does not equal a threat. And this is the case. This is why the Kenosha case has gone so viral is he was not approaching officers. He was not facing them. He was not brandishing a weapon towards them. And that is why there's claims that that was not a reasonable use of force in that case. His presence of a weapon doesn't make him a threat. And in this state, in this particular case, the law says a knife is not a dangerous weapon. That's not true in other states, but in our state, a knife is not a dangerous weapon unless it's used as one. Being in CJ and having people and talking to folks, I've talked to Chief McKinley here in town, and there are a lot of emotions around this. And because the police are being singled out as a profession, there are feelings that they're being scapegoated. And I would like to reframe that. And they are to some extent being expected to do things they shouldn't be and being blamed for not doing those properly. I can understand that. Responding to a mental health crisis and not being trained to do that and not doing it correctly, I can see why that would be very uh, feeling like you're being targeted for that. At the same time, police are held to the highest standard. They are given the trust of our of the people to enforce laws, to protect others, and in that process are allowed to violate the rights of others to keep that. 
And so they are held to an extremely high standard, just like anyone else who could kill or cause the death or harm of another person, like a doctor, right? We hold them to the highest of standards. And I don't think it's unreasonable to reiterate that fact. At the same time, I do believe there are people who may be just mad at the police because of their own personal experiences with them. And we do need to be empathetic towards that, at least. Policing is a dangerous job. There is a misconception that it is the most dangerous. I've seen memes go around from some of my friends. It's not even in the top 10. It is dangerous. I will admit that. So is nursing. And we laud those individuals for being willing to put themselves in danger. Nurses, first responders, EMS, firefighters, they're dangerous. But it is incorrect to think that it is the most dangerous job or that the danger has been increasing. It really has not recently. And so that was another myth that I had seen and I'd heard from students and others just generally. Police officers, unfortunately, are killed in the line of duty. And in terms of felonious killings, we typically have somewhere around 50-ish per year. And we do see when we break it down by race, we don't see a huge racial difference based on the communities that are being policed either. So this idea that Black Lives Matter is targeting police and doing ambush killings, that's not true. That's a common myth I've heard. There was a case in Texas, Austin? I can't remember the city. Um, in which case, uh, four, five officers were killed. And that gentleman was actually mad at Black Lives Matter organizers for not being willing to use violence. He, he actually stated that he was upset with them for not being violent enough. And one red herring among many that I've seen is this idea that police kill more white individuals than black individuals. And this is true by sheer statistics of our nation. When approximately 14% of the populace is black, yes, of course, more white people are killed in terms of numbers. And this is why we always have to look at rates. If you look at crimes and everyone goes, oh my God, Chicago. Well, yeah, there's 5 million people in Chicago. Of course, there's more crime there. The most murder capital of Wisconsin this past year? Hayward, Milwaukee was number three. So when we look at the number of incidents per person or per capita, that's why we need to bring statistics into this. Yes, Chicago looks dangerous. Out of 5 million people, it's, it's still somewhat in certain areas, sure. But we need to try to bring in some context to this to counter this narrative of these out of control areas, these uh, dangerous gangs are taking over. When I was young, 1990s, 1993 is the peak of crime in the entire country. We are back on to around the 1970s in terms of crime in this country. So the idea that we're getting more violent, that crime is going up, is not really supported by statistics. News reports of them, that's a different story. All right. I am happy to answer many, any questions um, about some of these issues, and I will leave it there and turn it over to Dr. Jalan. Hello, again, this is your moderator speaking. And um, thank you so much to Dr. Lasour for that wonderful thought provoking talk. I'll just again remind forum participants to please send me questions. And then I will introduce our third and final speaker of the evening, Dr. David Gelada, who's an associate professor of English at University of Wisconsin Platteville, where he teaches courses in writing, literature, film, and ethnic studies. Hello, um, I'm trying to share my screen. Is that happening? Is my, yes, okay, cool. All right, so uh, let's see, there we go. Okay, cool. So thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, first off, before I, uh, I jump in completely, I just wanna say that during the last five minutes of, of Will's talk, of course, I started getting, my internet started going fuzzy and I started getting your internet is unstable popping up on my screen every like <laughs> every like few minutes. So if I freeze, if I go fuzzy, just kind of bear with me. Um, I guess if it gets so bad, then just leave me behind and just and just go right <laughs> go right for the discussion. You guys have heard plenty to discuss so far, but uh, but. but uh, 
Anyway, uh, as uh, Dr. Tucker pointed out, um, I am in the humanities department and I, uh, I teach English courses, uh, predominantly literature and film courses. So the reason I wanna reiterate that is because I am, um, I'm not a social scientist and I'm not in criminal justice and I don't uh, intend to, uh, to really, in this forum, to speak outside of my expertise. Uh, so what I'm gonna do instead uh, is take this contextualization of the racial protests in a, in a pretty broad way uh, and look uh, more specifically at issues of racial representation in our culture. And uh, hopefully um, in doing so uh, kind of suggests how some of the ways in which the long history of um, really problematic racial representation in our country um, has influenced where we find ourselves today. So uh, what I have up here are a couple of quotes from some media studies scholars. This is just kind of media studies 101 stuff. I, uh, I'm not gonna read them both. I'll just read the first one to you. Um, this is a, a famous cultural critic named Stuart Hall. Uh, the media define for the majority of the population what significant events are taking place, but also they offer powerful interpretations of how to understand these events. And uh, another way of saying this, uh, I think, would be that um, representations, media representations, uh, structure and form our understanding of reality. Right? Um, and, and also, just to be clear, when I'm using the term media, uh, I am talking about more than just the news and more than just social media and more than just television and things like that. Uh, I'm talking um, about um, anything really that's representational. So visual arts, literature, storytelling, mythology, religious texts. Uh, so in the sense that I'm using it, uh, media uh, is, is as old as campfire stories and it's as old as cave paintings uh, that, these, that these things have been uh, shaping our understanding of reality. <clears throat> so um, let's just get right to it. Um, white, <laughs> white and black, black and white. Um, if you were to look around, um, you might, one of the things you might notice is that white people aren't white. They're not the color white, right? Um, I, I always look at myself and I'm like, I, I, I think I'm pink. Like if I had to, to pick a color, right? Um, and, uh, most, uh, if you look around at, at black people, mo most black people would fall somewhere in a shade of brown, um, in some manner or another. Okay. Uh, I think... this is important to, uh, to point out um, because race, and I don't have time to get into this um, in too much detail, but race is, as, the, as my colleagues in the social sciences would say, is a construction, right? It's, uh, it's something that uh, was constructed over time. And as we know it, race was started to be constructed uh, by Europeans, so, so white people, uh, in the 1600s, 1700s, around there. I, I don't have time to go into a whole kind of history there. Um, and when um, these kind of Enlightenment thinkers started categorizing people into color-coded groups, they didn't fall, uh, they didn't use the actual colors that people actually were, pink and brown. Um, instead, they fell back on a system of representation that was already in place uh, in order to categorize people, right? Um, we could do this with other groups as well, right? Um, the Native Americans are not red, right? Um, but uh, but there's, color, there's connotations there, right? Uh, so, um, uh, so when they came, fell, fell back on this old representational system, what they ended up doing, of course, was aligning, um, um, take, take, uh, they made white people aligned with positive values that were already in place uh, and associated with whiteness. So whiteness is already associated. Before race was even there, whiteness was already culturally associated with ideas of purity, cleanliness, innocence, understanding, truth, all of these things. And blackness was associated with sin and crime and filth. 
and darkness and ignorance and misunderstanding and all of these types of things. Uh, Malcolm X talks about this in his autobiography. And if any of you have seen Spike Lee's movie um, about Malcolm X, there's a really powerful scene where uh, Denzel Washington, who's playing Malcolm X, uh, the character is in jail and he looks up the words white and black in the dictionary. And he finds, um, as he moves through, these are the kinds of definitions that he finds when he gets to the fourth, fifth, sixth definition. He's like, who wrote this? It's the dictionary, right? Um, uh, as, um, as, as a kind of root of racist representation, that it's, that, it's, that it's there in that sense. So we can see it in images that just kind of are so widespread throughout the culture. Like, how do we think about heaven? How do we think about hell? What are the color schemes um, that we associate with these things? Okay, so, um, so these connotations are everywhere, right? And uh, in an American context, these associations really got mapped on to, uh, to race, right? Um, in all sorts of ways. So the two images that you see up on the screen here are from a movie called Birth of a Nation. Uh, it came out in 1914. It's about uh, the Reconstruction era, um, the, and it's based on a novel called The Klansman by, uh, by Thomas Dixon. It was directed by D.W. Griffith. It's usually considered the first blockbuster, right? The first huge movie in American history. Over here on the, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, we see the character Gus, who's actually a white actor wearing, uh, wearing blackface and uh, Gus is the villain of the movie. His really only goal in the movie is to sexually assault white women, right? Um, and then here on the right-hand side, we have from the movie, uh, and this image is um, when the good guys in Birth of a Name, finger quotes around good guys, uh, the heroes of the movie are the Ku Klux Klan, and they catch Gus and kill him, right? So in our first American blockbuster, basically what we have is this constructed in a way where audiences are cheering on a lynching, right? Um, and all of those associations with, uh, you know, Will was saying before, um, I'm sorry, Dr. Lesore was saying before uh, <laughs> that, uh, why are we talking about black men, black men um, in these, what, like, why is that conversation coming up? And I think part of the reason is that we, there's a long system of representation in place that associates black men with violence and criminality, particularly um, an aggressive violence. And there's a, a film scholar named Donald Bogle, and he uh, breaks down all the different stereotypes of black people into, um, into different groups. And he calls this the black buck, the violent black buck, who the only way you can handle the violent black buck is, is essentially um, to kill him, right? Uh, this movie, by the way, like I said, a uh, major blockbuster. Um, it, uh, it was screened in the White House for Woodrow Wilson, who uh, was apparently a big fan of it. I can't tell you for sure that this quotation is true. Uh, there's some debate, but it's often said that Woodrow Wilson, when he saw Birth of a Nation, said that it was like history being written with light or something like that. Um, and of course, this was 1914. Oh, side note, um, when, the, when this movie came out, this was right around the same time historically when all of the kind of Confederate monuments uh, that are also being debated right now were also being erected, right? Those weren't erected right after the Civil War. This happened uh, sometime later when, um, <clears throat> when people were really wanting to find ways to mythologize the South and to make heroes out of the Confederacy and things like that. And the Birth of a Nation contributed to that narrative as did many of these statues and things. Okay, so of course this didn't end with Birth of a Nation. Right. Um, in fact, uh, we, you can't, if you grew up in America, um, you were probably grew up they are everywhere. Images of violent, um, criminal black masculinity, right? Um, and, um, and I, my assertion here, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna make my talk a short talk uh, so that we have time for Q&A because I know that's important. I'm already coming up on 10 minutes here, um, or at about 10 minutes here. Um, but uh, my assertion here is that these images 
uh, unfortunately affect the way that we see people in the real world. So to bring it back to where we started with the protests, I have two images here, right? Um, and if you wanna ask ourselves, like uh, I think a question that we should ask ourselves is um, what do people see when they see somebody like George Floyd and they assume that the only way to stop him is to kneel on his neck for nine minutes? And what are people seeing when they see a person like Kyle Rittenhouse who is literally walking down the street with an assault rifle on his hand and decide that he's one of the good guys? Um, and, and I would argue that we've been, uh, many of us, we've been conditioned to read these images in certain ways uh, and to associate blackness with criminality and to associate whiteness um, with, uh, with innocence, even when that's not the case. And it affects the real world and it affects the, um, and it affects the way that police officers handle themselves, whether they know it or not. The implicit bias, right, would be uh, one of the words that would be relevant to use here. Um, and uh, because many of us become aware of these, are, are aware of these stereotypical images before we actually come into contact with any actual Black people. So it shapes our understanding of race uh, before we have any real understanding that could come up. Um, and I think that the only way, and this is the thought I guess I'll leave you with, um, and I think that the only way that, um, uh, or I think one of the things that we absolutely have to do is to kind of actively unlearn um, these types of stereotypes that we've been inundated with and seek out uh, narratives and images that offer us a kind of counter point of view. And we're actually really lucky because we're living in a time right now where there are a lot of really positive, um, a really, uh, a lot of really positive positive and really nuanced representations of black people out there if you're willing to look. Um, and, uh, and you can come in across a lot of those even, uh, even in your classes here. So, all right, I'm going to end it there. Thank you so much. I think she's muted again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gelato. Um, I'm going to pull up my guidelines for Q&A. We've had some um, really excellent questions already through the chat that just have reaffirmed my um, gratitude um, and pride in UW-Platteville students. But I just also want to um, kind of say, if you, if you still have, if, if there's still time to have questions, um, and so um, please do that. And then the other thing that I'm going to say before we begin the Q&A portion um, that is another reason why I wanted to have the screen. If you are looking for a recording of this forum, then you can follow up with Dr. Travis Nelson, who's Chair of Criminal Justice and Social Sciences. He will have a, a recording of this forum to share with you. Now, I know that we're a couple minutes past seven, but I want to make sure I, I won't keep us past 715. Okay, but I do think it's really important for our participants that um, we have time to ask questions of our, our uh, speakers. And so I'm going to kind of um, pose some of the great questions that our students have asked. Um, the first one is from um, Graham Brophy, who is a senior um, criminal justice major, and he is on track to become a police officer, but with everything that's happening, he's been reconsidering. Um, he doesn't, he says, I don't want to be part of a system that allows these horrible things to happen. Are there things I can do or try that will allow me to be more confident that I won't be contributing to a racist system as a police officer? So I will allow our, our speakers to address that. Um, I, I'll, I'll give that one a, a try. Uh, hi, Graham. And um, I guess my my comment is is unfortunately these systems that we have, even academia, are rooted in these histories and can and often do perpetuate these inequalities. And I know for me, one thing that was you know a, a thought is 
well, I'm going to go to the ivory tower and simply teach people that are going to, you know, be just a bunch of, and how am I actually going to help people for reals? And I guess it's a, you can try from within the system to reform things and create change and to uh, push forward in that process and to, you know, be one of the people that at least does, um, you know, tries to make these changes and tries to help their community um, as most officers would want to do to begin with. And the main thing is it's an active process. It's always, you always got to kind of question yourself. And this is true for us as professors. We always do this to ourselves. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know if Dr. Sappleton or Dr. Gelato wanted to also comment. I mean, I, I, um, I'm not one to give career advice or anything like that, but I, I would say that just the very fact that you're asking yourself that question is such is like just outstanding um, in the first place. And uh, um, regardless of what you decide, like you're in a, in a really good place. Um, and um, I would hope that there's a lot of other kind of future police officers and current police officers that are kind of also asking themselves that question. I agree. And I would just add that, like, we need you. What, what's your name? Graham? Like, you're exactly what we need um, in the system. Like, individuals who are conscious who will think about the ways in which your actions as a police officer, right, what not to do, like, to be aware and, like, to make that change that we want to see. So, yes, Graham, go and be the change that we need. <laughs> My 60 year old group needs you. I'll add one small other metaphor. I mean, you're, you're in the women gender justice with me and we're going to talk about domestic violence. Knowing that marriage is, has been historically a horrible institution, would you not get married just because of that? No, you can do better, right? So I, just because the institution's bad doesn't mean you have to just say, eh, screw it. I'm going to uh, pose another question to our panelists. Um, from Joey Gadiska, who is a senior engineering physics student, who asks, do the relatively small amount of protests that are violent receive too much coverage on the news just because they're sensational, or are there any other reasons for their overcoverage? I can take that. I, I often talk about this in my um, classes where I, I point out, sorry, David, <laughs> where I point out that the news is um, like, it's important for us to be um, like literate, right? Like in terms of like, like absorbing the news. So first we need to A, pay attention to the news, don't avoid it, um, but B, lend a critical eye to or ear to what we're hearing or, 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 or receiving, right? And so be, be, be very conscious about A, reputable sources, um, but also recognize that the media, that it's dual, it's a dual role. On the one hand, they bring you the news. On the other hand, they're also a business. And the business is what brings eyeballs um, to the giant TV that's in my living room, right? Money, money, money. And so if it um, what attracts individuals, what will force you to lean in besides COVID, us collectively to lean in and watch the news is because, oh my God, I can't believe that happens, then that is precisely what the news is going to cover. So, you know, the saying, no good news is no, good news is no news, right? So news is expected to be bad. It, it's true. And so for us as informed citizens, we need to then A, recognize that we're receiving this, but this is not the all of the picture and that there are various perspectives from which we should be assessing uh, at any one event. Dr. Um, Lasour, Dr. Gelada. I'll just do the, the phrases, if it bleeds, it leads. Mm -hmm. So we, we know that sensational stuff uh, it gets clicks. It's, it's clickbait. That's the new phrase, right? And um, I mean, you all remember the horrible parade that happened after the Cavs won, right, in Cleveland? No, you don't, because nothing happened at all. They were so worried there's going to be a huge riot, because every year in Cincinnati, whether or not the Buckeyes win, lose, tie, what, there's huge riots. But nothing happened. And so, of course, you don't remember it, because all you remember is they won. That's a really great example. <laughs> 
Um, I'm going to pose a couple more questions. One is from uh, Tanner Weber, who's a junior studying criminal justice. Um, and his question is really directed towards um, Dr. Sappleton, and that is what policies could be put forward in order to go in the right direction of racial equality in the criminal justice world? So I, I bet Dr. Lesore has some thoughts on this as well that he could contribute. <laughs> Excellent question, Tanner. Um, there's a whole forum on this. Um, it's policing, um, race and policing, I think. What date is that, um, Will? Can you jump in there? I think it's the fourth in the series of forums that are specifically going to look at particular policies. So I don't want to use the time to go into that, except to point out that like, we should, in fact, be figuring out what these policies are, who is introducing them, and again, assessing the extent to which they might work or might not work. Um, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll just defer to Will to speak more specifically to that or anyone else who's on here who will be doing that particular um, forum series. So that one the, on policing is on October 21st at 6 and um, we'll feature uh, Dr. Morris, Dr. Strobel, and Dr. Broussard, and um, Chief Dalsing from um, Dubuque. But um, I know just as uh, one thing you can Google about policy changes, there's something called eight can't wait, um, which are uh, eight immediate recommended policy changes that um, actually have some empirical evidence behind them, such as banning chokeholds, um, no shooting from moving cars or at moving targets, um, and some just general ideas, uh, the use of body-worn cameras. That's a good place to start, and there are plenty, plenty more. That is great. I'm just typing in the chat to everyone, eight can't wait because our panelists have been talking about doing reading and such, and so this is something that I think you could do after the panel. Um, so just maybe a, a couple more questions that I'll combine. Um, one comes from Jenna Wilson, who's a forensic investigation major. Um, and she asks, what is the panelist opinion to a few bad apples argument in policing? And then I'm gonna combine them. Um, actually, let's, let's just take that question. <laughs> so let's, let's stay there. Um, I, go ahead, Dr. Oh, and m mine isn't going to be a real answer, um, uh, but it, I'm reminded of a, of a Chris Rock joke that like policing isn't a profession that has room for bad apples. You know what I mean? There's certain professions. Yes, yes, yes. Face. Uh, <laughs> and, and it just kind of reminded me of that. Uh, but I, I think the real answer to the question, though, is we're not is we're talking about a systemic problem. Um, we're not talking about problems with individuals, uh, but but Will, you're much more qualified to address this question. <laughs> um, no, I it's it is bad apples, but the bad apples are representative of a larger issue, um, in that um, we're often talking about more abstract things than just individual bad actors. Uh, same would be with the military and the recent issues around sexual violence at um, uh, Fort Hood. Uh, the same would be with the teachers who um, have recently been caught molesting children. Um, yes, they're individual bad actors, but there's also larger issues that need reforming. Um, or, you know, say, again, I'll bring back with surgeons. Um, you don't want a bad apple surgeon. And we're talking about people who really can do life and death decisions. So the fact that we hold police to very high standards, uh, I think is appropriate and really displays the trust that we do give them. And just, I'll, I'll just add to that, just as a reminder, right? Police are like a, 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 an arm of our government, right? That enforces our rules. And so in effect, they're acting on behalf of the government, right? And so here you're saying you are subject to different treatment, to more violence that is carried out by the state. And so there should in fact be higher standards for police, meaning that these are the individuals we entrust with our lives, the government should protect, not um, engage in state violence against its citizens, whichever category they belong. I'm gonna have our final question for the evening. 
um, from Emily Von Uvine, who is a sophomore at the Richland Branch campus, who asks a great question for us to close to all of our panelists. And she asks, how can we start to deconstruct the stereotypes we have developed? I, I think the, um, the, the, the key word in that question is how can we start? Um, Cause it's not something that we can just do really quick and it's like a process. And, and I think, I think like just doing something like what we're doing right now is starting, right? You know what I mean? Just having these conversations and constantly listening and thinking um, and paying and paying close attention, I think, is a great start. Um, I would say that the representation matters. And while it's almost gone to the point of doing it just to be inclusive, hashtag inclusive at times, that those positive images to counteract, uh, like Dr. Jalal said, with the birth of the nation, these very deeply ingrained images in our society. And they're not something we can, we're, we're brought up with these, right? Even from Looney Tunes. And they are really, as you said, start to unlearn some of them. And frankly, that whole listen, look, seek to, seek to hear those voices from under that metaphorical veil. Um, I was surprised to learn that we, Dubuque was literally the whitest part of the entire United States in the early 90s. And we are still one of the whitest regions in the area. And that alone, just mere exposure and willingness to hear can do a lot, a lot. Great. And like, I'm always pushing for us to be global citizens. So go beyond whether through your television or TikTok is a thing now, apparently, right? You can be anywhere in the world and experience different cultural norms and just realize that places in different cultures are that. They're different, right? They're not inferior. They're simply different. And why you think it's weird, and you can use the term weird, but please put air quotes around weird. It's, you should simply mean that they're different because it's not the norm in which you grow up. And what that tells us then is our norm, or what we consider to be norm, is rather limited to our experiences, our lived experiences, which may or may not be the lived experiences of others. And so in as much as we listen to and engage, whether through music, through film, right, there's any number of ways to tap into, I will invite you to come talk patois with me um right in my office hours i'll teach you um right and so like just be open to the experiences of others and be willing to listen so that when someone says this is my lived experience my lived experience you're not quickly like oh no that cannot possibly be well because that's not my lived experience right and so that's the way we start breaking down the boundaries so expand beyond our immediate um friendship network right um get familiar with some other um, culture. And I would say this before COVID, like go on a study abroad program. Apparently they're being offered now virtually. So study abroad virtual programs um, and just broaden your horizons. And some of those will automatically kind of break down at least at some point in that experience, you'll come face to face with your own biases and then make a change hopefully. Yeah. Can I That's break the rules? for one second and just to also encourage the international perspective in terms of the question about how can we change the system and uh, reforms other countries do it and that's the one thing is other countries do this and do it differently with a vastly different outcome um, and that means that we can too but it's going to take a lot of uh, a lot of change and, and willingness to understand that perspective i lived in japan for two years and I think as Steinbeck said that travel is the vaccine against racism or some, some quote similar to that, but it really, really does change your worldview. And so just looking at how it's done elsewhere because it works there. Those are some great recommendations from our speakers. Um, again, we cannot, we're all muted, but, but we are, I, I'm so grateful to our speakers today for for their enlightening um, conversations. Um, please know that you can reach out if you have questions, if there's other things you wanna talk about. Um, you can reach out to Dr. Travis Nelson, um, who's in charge of this forum. 
And then I just want to remind you of the next forum in this series. And the topic is what is the what's the legacy of mass incarceration on communities of color? So that is going to be on September 30th at 6 p.m. You can register for that at the same place on our website that you did, registered for this forum. So I thank you so much for staying past seven. I'm so appreciative, not only to our speakers, but to um, our forum participants who really embodied um, what our panelists are talking about, this idea of critical listening, um, which is so, so important to addressing issues of racial equity. So thank you guys all so much. Have a wonderful evening.